Butterfuss was founded at the height of the anti-war movement in 2006 when Pam and I were in art school in Chicago. We've both been part of LASSO, the Latin American student organization on campus, and had been very inspired by the massive immigrant rights marches that we attended between 2005 and 2006. Uh, this is sort of the moment that we were politicized. Uh, in 2005, I took a class with this guy called Chris Catron on Adorno and the culture industry. It was mind-blowing to think about the relationship that culture had to like fascism and to communism. And by sheer serendipity, Pam ended up taking a class with Chris that summer as well. He made us read Marx, Russell Luxemburg, and many others, but quite importantly, he made us read a correspondence between Adorno and Marcuse on the German New Left. Uh, it was published in the um, uh, New Left Review, uh, but it was uh, written in 1969. In this text, they argued over the limitations and potential of the radical student politics of 1968. This reading sparked some other students to ask Chris to lead a reading group on the politics of the New Left. Chris invited Pam and me, among other students, to participate. This became the first part of this reading group dedicated to reading what we call the symptoms of the new left from a book called The New Left Reader, published in 1969, that is in the major turning point of the new left. Um, Richard, a Gen X founding member of Platypus that came up with the idea for the name of Platypus with Chris, I found this book in a bookstore in Chicago. It was a brilliant recommendation because the book, as an anthology dedicated to a generation of radicals known as the New Left of the 1960s, it included text from super important figures such as Malcolm X, Althusser, Franz Fanon, Fidel Castro, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, Rudy Ditschka, Mark Rudd, and many others. So the ideological leaders and organizational leaders of the New Left. Exactly. Thank you. Um, but, these re but reading these texts side by side, 40 years after the fact, after they were published, was, I would say, a weird and yet uh, life-changing experience. I remember being blown away uh, by Martin Nicolás's text, The Unknown Marx, which is part of our main reading group. And I remember being shocked to learn that Fidel Castro, who, by the way, in you know, went to university with my grandmother in Havana and who forced my father's family to flee Cuba to Miami because of the Cuban Revolution. Um, Fidel Castro had nothing to do with Marxism. Um, so imagine sort of my shock after growing up, you know, with very, very anti-communist, anti-Marxist parents uh, that everything in Cuba was shit, uh, only to learn that in fact by reading Castro in this book, it had really nothing to do with Marxism. So the hindsight actually provided from the historical standpoint of 2006, that is when the anti-war movement was in full force, and the new SDS, in which Pam and I participated through different leading bodies, was founded, really made us feel like there was something in the air, that maybe something was happening. Armed with a banner that said, the left is dead, long live the left, we came out guns blazing that is, with heroic confidence. It felt like we were touched by the angel of history or the ghost of Marxism or something. But, um, however, actually, this sort of moment also came with a negative lesson. History began to weigh like a nightmare on us the more we were exposed to the so-called left and the more we learned about its history. The provocation, the left is dead, began to feel palpable despite huge protests and the growth of student activism. We began to feel deeply ambivalent about the left as this slogan became more of a statement of fact than a mere provocation, while at the same time it strengthened our determination to learn more about the history of the left and its aspiration to move beyond capitalism. So that first deep dive into the history of the new left in 2006, the starting of platypus amidst everything that was happening between 2006 and 2007, allowed us, Pam and me, to make, and everybody else in part of us actually, to make some important yet troubling connections between the new left and our moment, our moment then, in 2006, 2007. 
Beyond the complete romanticization of 1968 that we experienced, uh, we found a lot of continuity with the different ideas expressed in the book, The New Left Reader, and the politics of the people we were meeting at anti-war protests and in the new SDS. Some of the things that we encountered or really exposed to that you know, also paralleled the book was the anti-authoritarianism and anti-intellectualism of the new uh, SES, a complete disregard for Trotskyism and Lenin, infighting over civil disobedience actions, red baiting against the Maoists, who honestly, yes, were doing some weird shit, um, bad decisions made because of identity politics, and so on. So with an elementary understanding of Marxism, we saw that a lot of the problems of the new left actually persisted and were not overcome or even recognized. And in fact, the problems had gotten much worse because that history had become so obscure and opaque by 2006, we could not do anything about it in the new SDS. We tried, but failed. There was a very misplaced optimism in that moment, so any attempt to be critical was quickly shut down or not received at all, because he was either too intellectual to raise historical facts or too authoritarian to try to lead the organization. And this problem, honestly, has become even worse in the course of the last 14 years. So this was the original way most of the people that founded Platypus began to understand the historical problems of the left, that is, through thinking about the new left of the 1960s and its relationship to the founding moment of Platypus. The point here is that Pam and I represent the older millennial generation that founded Platypus and our work in Platypus allowed us to experience the birth, the moment of potential of the millennial left, which, also, which we also represent as a moment of potential opportunity that was, however, quickly dispelled by our ability to connect our moment, our experience with the history of the left. One of the main features that makes Platypus unique is that it is a project that was born out of the recognition that the left is dead. That is, that the left has ceased to be a political force with utopian aspirations. The left has been completely unable to keep up with historical crisis and thus changes in capitalism itself. Sorry, furthermore, the left has been completely unable to keep up with historical crisis and thus changes in capitalism itself. We consider this recognition of regression our most important point of departure. In practice, this means we have tasked ourselves to recover a critical history of the left or a Marxian philosophy of the history of the left. We think this is necessary because the history of the left represents our theory of the present, allows us a means of understanding and thus maybe potentially changing the course of history. It also expresses our foundational insight. The circumstances we face represent only the latest iteration in a long series of regressive repetitions. History does not simply repeat itself in the present, but disintegrates in and through its self-reproduction. The present suffers from unmastered history. For the, furthermore, with this left-centric view of history, we could see how through the course of the new left, through the course of the new left in the 70s and 80s, it made repeated concessions and ended up liquidating itself into the Democratic Party. By liquidation, I mean liquidation is what we call when the left has abandoned its political goals, and principles by aligning itself with liberals or reformists or delude themselves in believing that they can push the most powerful, powerful political party in the world to the left. Because our education on the new left, in a moment that the left was um, much stronger, bigger, diverse, active, and international, right? So because of our education on the new left, sort of the, the, the moment that the left was much stronger, bigger, active, international than our own, um, we were introduced to the nuances um, of where the new left started, how it evolved, and where it ended up. This it allowed us to understand and make an informed judgment about our own moment back in 2006, 2007, and thus the birth of the millennial left, and thus 
a judgment on the birth of the millennial left as a missed opportunity. Why? Because the millennial left fell way below the threshold of the new left, while at the same time it did not see that the new left had failed, mostly due to self-inflicted problems. The millennial left, outside of Platypus, was refusing to learn from history. As the old saying goes, those who don't take history seriously are bound to repeat the mistakes of the past. The old Hegelian adage that history repeats itself, quote, the first time as strategy, the second time as farce, is truly haunting us today. It's barely, you know, false ghost shadow uh, uh, of what it once was, right? Um, so when we saw the millennial left as a reproduction or continuation, albeit with a difference, that is, in the greater form of the new left, we began to read history against the grain, or were or we were able to use history to throw a critical light on the present. We could see the same problems repeating themselves in the millennial left, particularly through our experience in the new SES, that they were heading down the same route of liquidating into the Democratic Party. This time, it was Obama. Obama. Open change. Um, so, in Platypus, we read and study the history of the left so that we can understand those unresolved problems. This is why in Platypus we teach the history of the left negatively, in terms of what the left has forgotten. In Platypus, we call this teaching a sensibility towards history. And this sensibility, alongside the recognition of ever-deepening historical regression through the course of the 20th century, probably even earlier, comes from Marxism itself. Marxism as the imminent critique of the left and capitalism, imminent dialectical critique of the left and capitalism. So, the history of Marxism, including its failure, serves as a guide to thinking. We teach against the grain of its reception, especially by the new left, by posing Lenin against so-called Leninism, by posing Marx against so-called Marxism, and so on. We teach with a different spirit than the left, even though our readings and the primary reading group that was mentioned earlier are very much selected from the leftist canon. But we're, but we're not just negative about leftists because they are insufficiently Marxist. The left itself is a negative image for us. But this reading of history against the grain, which a term that comes from Walter Benjamin, allows us to continually pose questions. Many without answers, but we need to know what those questions are. We read the history of Marxism as an opportunity to pose questions for the present that the present seeks to avoid. We also raise Marxism itself as a question rather than an answer. Marxism's self-understanding and its failure use a whole different set of questions, such as, why is the world the way that it is? and what should, can, must be done about it. Our platypus education has taught us that the death of the left was self-inflicted, that the liquidation of the left and the abandonment of the left's political goals, such as international socialist revolution, has, long, has a long, deep history and is not limited to the US. In the UK, with the Labour Party and the so-called left, even before Corbyn and Tony Blair, um, they also share this history. So, the liquidation of the left into the establishment parties has been happening over and over again for at least three generations. Possibly this problem goes all the way back to the SPD, to the German SPD, voting for war credits in 1914. Or perhaps this problem goes even deeper into Marx's own time. But now, this regression is happening for now, now, this regression is happening in an even less sensible form than with the new left this regression, historical regression, and loss of historical memory. Um, for example, the civil rights movement in particular, as Pam will get into a bit later, was used by the Democrats during the Democratic Party realignment for the black vote in the 1960s, then again in the moment of the election of Obama. But no one, perhaps except Platypus, saw it coming. When Obama got elected, even the most radical people in the new SDS refused to protest the election of a Democrat on the account of him being the first black president. 
Obama ran as the anti-war candidate, but actually became known as the drone president because of the exponential growth in airstrikes during his administration. Plus, one of his campaign promises was to pass a popular labor reform called EFCA, meaning the Employee Free Choice Act. Instead, and I know this because I helped, Obama used this to get labor unions to send their members to campaign door to door to get the vote out in black working class neighborhoods in swing states such as Indiana and Michigan. And it worked. Obama won those swing states. And almost and on election evening, everybody on the left was crying with joy. I was in Chicago and I saw the biggest accumulation of people of my entire life um, to celebrate Obama's victory in Chicago, which is where he's originally from. Um, in exchange, Obama forced all the unions to negotiate with him through one unified body completely squashing any potential left-wing pressure within the unions. And then once he got sworn in, EFCA got thrown away within his first 100 days. EFCA, by the way, was dear to my heart because it also included special clauses that would protect illegal immigrants from being deported. One of the big reasons for my support for it and one of the big reasons why for my disappointment in Obama, even though, by the way, I actually didn't vote for him. Because of this, um, you know, Obama was also eventually nicknamed the deporter in chief. So he had way more deportations than the previous uh, presidents. So just to so, clarify, what Platypus members wanted to do was demand that we have teachings protesting Obama and the Democratic Party, um, that the new SDS would host a series of teachings around the nation. Um, and this specifically was rejected because as the leaders of the USDS had told us when we were in arguments with them, there was no way in hell that the new SDS was going to protest the first black president of the United States. Exactly. So all of this is getting somewhere, trust me guys. So um, Chris, who published several pieces critical of Obama in the lead up of the election and after the election, uh, in 2009, articulated how deep this problem of the left might be, really opened up sort of the historical view for us in, in this passage. The present crisis, and I'm reading for Chris, quote, the present crisis of the post fordist neoliberal capitalism points not to the end of neoliberalism, but rather to its transformed continuation. We will be moving into a period in which are accumulated and reconfigured the historical legacies of all previous periods in capitalism. This includes the liberal one of the mid to late 19th century, the era of monopoly capitalism and imperialism of the late 19th century to the early 20th century, the Fordist era of the high middle 20th century, and the neoliberal era of the late 20th century. The question is whether this compounding of problems of capitalism since Marx's time makes it more political, politically and theoretically intractable. So now I'm going to switch to the crisis of neoliberalism and 2016 as an inflection point. So 2016 also marked the 10 year anniversary of Platypus. And over the course of Platypus's first decade, through Occupy, up until the rise of Bernie Sanders and Corbyn, up until Brexit and Trump's election, we saw multiple examples, countless really, of how much the millennial left was born stillborn. Perhaps Platypus is the only exception. From the moment of our founding, and still to this day, our experience has shown that history ceased to weigh like a nightmare upon the brains of the living, but only because the living had ceased to dream. Again, perhaps Platypus is the only exception. Perhaps. In another 2007 article, uh, sorry, yes, 2017 article, uh, The Millennial Left is Dead. Um, in his 2017 article, The Millennial Left is Dead, published on the occasion of the 100th 
issue of the Platypus Review, Chris charted the death of the millennial left from the rise of Sanders to the 2016 election, and then the aftermath of the election. That is, Chris charted the course of the millennial left from the founding of Platypus and the anti-war movement and the refounding of the new SDS in 2006 to the DSA, that is the Democratic Socialists of America, because, because they had a huge boom explosion, they were obviously all around uh, supporting Bernie Sanders. But it was not until Trump won in 2017 when he got into power, um, uh, when he was sworn in as president, um, it was the DSA really exploded in membership numbers. It was after Trump won. So, uh, by the way, Chris's charting of the course of the millennial left also includes Corbynism and momentum as parable, parallel developments to the DSA in the United States. But it also reaches back before the 2015-2016 phenomenon, namely all the ways in which left collapsed in the face of the economic crisis after 2008. Platypus organizes organized a lot of panels around the crisis of 2008 and 2009 um, that are worth looking into for that moment. As Chris pointed out, in the millennial, the millennial left has been subject uh, to a triple knockout of Obama, Sanders, and Trump. That's, that's the experience of Pam and I. And this is really the experience that Pam and I had in the first decade of Platypus between 2006 and 2016. Um, but 2016, quite importantly for Platypus, also marks the crisis of neoliberalism, what we call the crisis of neoliberalism, what we understand as the crisis of neoliberalism, which had two opposing phenomena. On the one hand, the supposed revival of socialism, with Bernie Sanders and Corbyn leading, leading the charge. And on the other side, the sharp turn to the right, the potential of the rights of fascism and uh, in, in with Brexit and Trump. So part of his first decade focused on the left, and at that moment in 2016, it seemed that the second decade, we had to turn our attention to the question of socialism. Socialism was everywhere. The Economist was covering it. It was in the Wall Street Journal. Everybody was, quote unquote, talking about socialism. And the DSA was thinking that this was the largest moment of opportunity in history, in decades. Um, in reality, oh, but this uh, revival of socialism has already run its course, and it's become more important Thus, to inscribe our founding moment, which is what I tried to do today. In reality, the last four years were not really about socialism, but about capitalism, about our ability to interpret the present and grasp, however dimly, continuity and importantly, change in the present. The task is to grasp the new, however conservative and reactionary it may be, even if we have no way of directly fighting against it. And what we saw in the last four years, in the clear absence of viable socialist politics, numerous socialist movements with radical potential were channeled into identity and interest-based political constituencies that have been integrated democratically as objects of the state in the United States, primarily through the Democratic Party, in the UK, primarily through the Labour Party, um, but with the Democratic, party, especially the claims to represent the black community, the gay vote, Latino interests, etc. Meanwhile, on the opposing side of the culture wards, the Republican Party has tapped the discontents of many suburban and rural and working class whites. All such identitarian appeals, despite their apparent liberalism, remain deeply authoritarian and are an index of the last failure. For example, one important lesson drawn from the pre-Obama presidency came in early 2008 during the 40th anniversary of May 1968. Platypus founder and SDS leader Ben Blomberg's article in the PR, that is the Platypus Review, cited Daniel Kahn Bendit, aka Danny Le Rouge, uh, a German-French uh, activist that was very important in 1968, um, but who is now part of the EU Parliament, um, 
he said, Ben quoted Daniel Convenance saying of 1968, that we won culturally and socially, but lost politically, thank God. Thank God that we lost politically. So to say that we won culturally and socially, whatever that might mean, uh, but not politically, of course means that they won nothing at all, and yet they called it a victory. This is the quote, cultural term, which at least since the 60s represents a depolitization and abandonment of the political task of the left. And it should come as no surprise that in the face of the shock and disorientation of Brexit and the election of Trump, that the so-called left witness, um, well, sorry, and it should come as no surprise that in the face of the shock and disorientation of Brexit and the election of Trump, the so-called left, which is nothing but Democrats and Liberals, was going to double down on identity politics. The liberal crack up in response to the shock of Trump and Brexit was at another level. Let's not forget the days and weeks that people were posting about how devastated and shocked they were. Okay, yes, I see 25 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna to try to cut the my Me Too part a bit. Um, but one major symptom that's very important for me to end my presentation with, one major symptom of the less response to, uh, to Trump was Me Too. With feminism or other forms of identity politics, especially Me Too, we see the consequences of the failure of the left and Marxism. If we go back to the new left, to the new left, the 60s women's movement crystallized a process by which feminism became, became an ideology of left of the left wing of liberal individualism. The cultural tone and identity politics more generally represent an adaptation to lowered horizons of potential social transformation and reinforces those lowered horizons by focusing on the individual transformation as opposed to society as a whole. That leaves us today with feminism and Me Too an example of that is like Me Too demands the protection of women from sexual advances from the state by extension, the legal and police forces that represent the rural capital or basically the recommendation, of recommendation and persecution for bad sexual practices. So like Me Too is demanding that the state and companies and everybody address um, a problem that is, you know, produced by capitalism, but it's being addressed at the, at the level of individuals. So Me Too really was nothing but the Democratic Party doubling down on its decades-long strategy to win elections by capturing minority wars through identitarian appeals. Me Too expresses the liberal frustration with the election of Trump, specifically the defeat of Hillary, who was supposed to be Obama 2.0 with the selling point as the first female president in history. In fact, on the eve of the 2016 election, and of Ellen uh, in fact, on the eve of the 2016 election, when Hillary lost, a lot of us, but not all, in part of us, felt a sense of relief. Maybe, finally, something other than this farcical repetition of the left liquidation through the cultural identity politics, liquidation into the Democratic Party, was finally over. We thought that it didn't work with Hillary. So there would be, a, maybe there would be a reconstituting of the Democratic Party and thus perhaps maybe some room for the left, perhaps. But the Democratic Party didn't get that it didn't work with Hillary as Obama to war, and they're doing again the same again. Now with Biden, Obama's VP. He might win the elector, he might lose the, the vote. It's not clear yet, we'll know very, very soon. But the last four years have seen a clear doubling down of identity politics. And I have, I mean, you know, like the pussy hat protests are like a great, very important Mitchell um, example here. But the return of the cultural narrative expressed in the, with the Daniel Convento quote, right? The turn to culture. Um, Potipus has sort of taught us that it is a sign of the liquidation of the left into the Democratic Party. Um, can we and, can pick up there? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think in that spirit of trying to render the present historical, um, we're going to unfold how this problem appears to us today in the present through cancel culture, right? So cancel culture, our thesis is it expresses a kind of frustrated liberalism, 
So cancel culture, for those who've been living under a rock or just don't happen to know, uh, has been mostly an American phenomenon, but has recently spread to other parts of um, Europe, France, the UK, perhaps other places. Essentially, it's a tactic that seeks to displace people from positions of power for their racist, sexist, homophobic behavior through a kind of social media bullying in the name of justice for a community. So that community being black, women, gay people, etc. It is a means to deep platform to take away the right to speak as part of civil society. So it means that you know, there is civil society, but not everyone gets to speak. Racist, sexist, homophobes are out. Free speech, once a sort of tenet of liberalism, has now become a liability because it may give reactionary perspectives as a hearing. So how does this play out? Uh, today, this plays out by excluding conservatives from university events, outing people for their opinions on social media in order to disrupt career opportunities, book deals, TV shows, etc. But lately, these cancel campaigns have targeted regular people to oust them from their jobs. So they put pressure on hiring institutions, cancelers put pressures on hiring institution, calling out people for hiring or promoting sexists, racists, etc., thus forcing a more enlightened or woke capitalism through the mobilization of shame and fear. So what is this phenomenon in the present and how does it point to this kind of deep problem that Laura keeps pointing to, which is about the history of the dead left that has been accumulating in the present? How does it help us understand this? So we think that cancel culture hinges on this liberal idea that capitalist society should serve the interests of different groups. Cancel campaigns aim to make way for these marginalized people to get a seat at the table. It promises them the capacity to make decisions on, and this is important, who gets what, right? So at the end of the day, it's still about jobs, who should get them, who shouldn't get them, who gets to hire and fire people. And it's in this way that cancel culture plays into the rackets of the neoliberal status quo. Importantly, who represents these marginalized people are always those who have joined the elite few, those who are capable of speaking for the rest. This token or aesthetic egalitarianism, wherein representatives are of a community are chosen on the basis of their authentic cultural experience, was built on the inherited ideas of the cultural turn during the new left, right? So we've kind of normalized this as just a way that we think about politics and marginalized people and power, but these are inherited ideas, historically inherited ideas that come from the new left. Um, you can find an example of this, for example, in the Black Lives Matter movement, where your Instagram was probably um, busy with posts that demand that you support Black people. And the way that one does that is by learning what Black businesses are around you and that you do your part and you buy Black, right? So this is like one way in which people thought that solidarity with the Black people of the world could come about. Um, and there's a reason for this, this unconscious political perspective, this kind of aesthetic egalitarianism has a history and it is a history of accommodation to defeat. The left today remains bound to political capitulation under the guise of cultural liberation, political capitulation under the guise of cultural liberation. We are stuck not in 1848 and certainly not in 1917, but in 1968 in the new left. So the new left popularized the notion of politics as an expression of personal experience. That is black faces in places of political and social power serve the interests of black communities, right? As an example, this idea derives from the faulty premise that membership in a group or a community, right? An organic group, gives access to a shared perspective and an intuitive understanding of the group's collective interests. The personal is political, 
personal experience reveals the ways in which we have been indoctrinated, molded, constructed by colonialist, imperialist, racist, sexist, etc. forces. The enemy is within all of us. Today, calls to decolonize are everywhere. Decolonize the museum, decolonize your syllabus, decolonize your coffee, your yoga, whatever. You have to fight the straight, cis, white, toxic cop inside of you. Decolonize your mind. Decolonize your mind. So consciousness, right, in this way of thinking, equals experience and a specific kind of experience, sort of authentic cultural experience that we all have to tap into in order to understand the world. The legacy of the new left, and it's not just one, but certainly among, among these we've inherited from the new left, is that claims of authenticity of experience are the basis of the truth content in politics. This was not always the case, right? So authenticity of experience is the basis of truth content in politics be contrasted to the idea that history and a consciousness of a political end, an understanding of the goals of socialism is what drives political consciousness. This is the platypus point, that somehow the new left loses a sense of an inherited political task of the ongoing struggle for universal emancipation and how this goal might speak to 1968 as a guide to revolutionary consciousness. In the half century that has passed between 68 and today, the left, the new left's oppositional politics of cultural authenticity have become the model for a new form of social management within neoliberalism. That is, racial or gender democracy is the established form of managing discontents in capitalist society in the era of neoliberalism. A celebration of blackness and gender diversity are at the forefront of the corporate world. That is, all the while concentrations of poverty in black neighborhoods and unequal wages between men and women persist despite the aesthetics of representation. When the left, the left, defends this token egalitarianism, it defends the management of social discontent under an antiquated form of management, right? So it's on its way out. We're living in this transitional point from neoliberalism into a kind of post-neoliberal politics. And yet they hold on to this previous form of managing social discontent. Who should get the jobs? Who should hire and fire people? those who are the woke capitalist. And they see this and celebrate it as a form of racial diversity. The left is dead. It means that the left tails after the ideology of the corporate capitalist managers who pin working people against one another to dole out the jobs as they see fit. For Marx, on the other hand, working class consciousness was built through political fights as well as debates and lessons learned in and through organization, whether that be the international, the socialist party, etc., whatever the socialists were supposed to build. In this sense, we say, long live the left. But clearly something gets lost in the new left. And so we asked, what is the character of this regression? What happened? The new left in the United States in 1960s and 70s includes students for a democratic society, the Maoists, new communist movement, second wave feminist, and Black Panther Party among them. In this period, anti-colonial movements that grew in Africa and Asia amidst the crumbling French and British colonial empires had a significant impact on Black resistance in America. And what resurfaced in this time is this Black nation thesis, an inheritance, a holdover from the old left, that is the left of the 1920s, the 1930s, the Stalinist left in America represented by the Communist Party. This Black Belt formula first was developed in 1928 and in state, it was instated as the official party policy in 1930. 
The idea was that the black population in a portion of the United States constituted a nation within a nation. Communists were compelled to advocate for the black belt's national self-determination. The black belt thesis was elaborated within the party during the same years that Stalin's theory of socialism in one country naturalized the nation state as the quote unquote organic boundary for revolutionary politics. So here we already see that there is a reversal. For Marx, the international revolution was necessarily an international fight for socialism. And yet already within the 1930s, self-determination is bound to this moment in where the nation becomes this organic boundary for revolutionary politics. Socialism in one country, which would have been seen as a defeat from the standpoint of Marx, is presented as a victory. So what happened, right? There's this, there's this problem that's already in the 1930s that the new left is inheriting. The, the new left reaches for this thesis as it's coming up against the limits of the civil rights movement. And this is the birth moment of the new left, where the new left pushed against the limits of liberal reform. So in their attempt to create an opposition to the liberals in power, they reach for the existing oppositional ideologies and what they find is the black belt thesis. So just to clarify, the civil rights movement had done away with voting restrictions for black people, it had done away with racial segregation, but there were problems that remain. And mainly those problems were poverty, unemployment, and importantly, the Vietnam War. And for the new left, this created a conundrum because some of the same liberals that had supported doing away with voting restrictions and racial segregation, on the other hand, supported the Vietnam War, right? And so the, the new left was born from these frustrations with liberal reform. Ideological issues posed by black nationalism were quote unquote rediscovered by the new left in the 1960s. But because this younger generation failed to address the, theoretic, the theoretical failures of the old left, and the political impasse of the old left, they ultimately ended up reproducing the same ideological shortcomings, right? So there's a kind of historical repetition, a pathological repetition of the unresolved problems of earlier generations. Ben Blumberg, who Laurie mentioned and who was also part of the new SDS with us, he wrote for the Platypus Review on the Black question. He says, what the new left found was an attenuated form of ideology, relevant, albeit in a problematic way, to historical, socio-political, economic, and cultural conditions that had since undergone significant change. So what this means is that the 1960s New Left found ways of thinking about the challenge of race and racism that may have corresponded to the period of the 1930s and 40s, of a segregated industrial workforce which they had superseded after the civil rights movement. One example we may call to mind is the March of Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. This is the big march in DC where MLK gives his I Have a Dream speech. This march was supposed to happen in the 1940s, that is before the integration of the American working class that happens under the leadership of the Democratic Party. Why didn't it happen? Why didn't this integrated march for jobs and freedom happen in the 1940s? Because there was a concession made to FDR Democrats, to the Democratic Party. It was risky to have the march for jobs and freedom as an integrated working class because it risked losing the New Deal coalition within the Democratic Party. A progressive capitalist alliance of liberal capital with middle-class conservatism, right, which labor in the United States helps to uphold. It was in the 1930s and in the 40s when the American communists worked within the Democratic Party. And so instead of the communists leading the independent integration of the working class, independent from the party, it's the Democratic Party that helps to integrate the working class, which is why, by the way, it's only after the civil rights movement and only after the civil rights movement that the Democrats are considered to be quote unquote on the left 
of the Republicans in the popular imagination, you know, because prior to that, the Republicans had been the party of labor. It had been the Republicans that had defeated the Southern, the Southern slaveholders, right? So it was the Republicans that were the party of labor. And it's only after uh, the Democrats integrate the working class with the help of the unions during the civil rights period, where now there's this image of the Democrats as being somehow on the left. By the 1960s, the new left call for independent black organization, therefore means something entirely different. Black power explicitly rejected integration as the major aim of a revolutionary movement, marking a retreat from the original goal of a unified revolutionary working class. This insight, by the way, is recognized at the onset of the black power turn in the late 1960s by Harold Cruz, whose crisis of the Negro intellectual we have read in Platypus, Cruz reflects on the intergenerational connections between the old and the new left's understanding of the challenge of race and racism, right? The challenge, not that to be celebrated, but a problem, race is a problem for the revolution. In a chapter called Postscript on Black Power, Cruz wrote, when the direct action methods of the civil rights movement failed against hardening barriers, they had to fall back on the slogan of black power as if to convince themselves that they were taking a revolutionary step forward. Whatever it is, whatever this is, is essentially another variation of the old communist left-wing doctrine of self-determination in the black belt areas of Negro majority. So this takes us back further to the Stalinist popular front, when communists became cheerleaders for Roosevelt's New Deal, working closer to the Democratic Party than any previous American radical could ever have imagined, leading to an alliance between labor and the state led by the Communist Party. Um, so one of the things that I pulled from was an article titled Intersectionality, the Highest Stage of Western Stalinism, written by Mike McNair, who is uh, a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, who we've engaged in Platypus a great deal. And he pointed to how the Popular Front policy had led the communists for the first time to treat the official women's movement leaders and official black community leaders as legitimate representatives of group interests, wholly separate from the class interest of the working class. And it's in this period where communists begin to elaborate class, gender, and race as a kind of trinity. Labor was presented as one of the interests among many, represented in this regard by the unions working within the Democratic Party. The People's Front was defended at the 1935-7 Congress of the Common Term and was predicated on the party actually self-censoring in order to maintain unity. McNair sees parallels here to what Lenin critiqued as a form of trade union consciousness, that is, as the petty bourgeois consciousness of the working class. What could this mean? Well. The role of socialists becomes, in the 1930s and 40s, to manage the labor discontents through union representatives that work as part of the table of the Democratic Party, right? So the unions get a seat at the table of the Democratic Party in the same way in which women interests, Black American interests also get a seat. The goal of socialism, that is the task of political leadership of an independent working class movement working towards the abolition of class society is out of the picture. We should say that the New Deal nostalgia today, the calls for a new New Deal, also commit the same error. McNair treats Stalinism as a capitulation to liberalism, right? And a kind of liberal conception of interest-driven politics. But this history, this problem of the old left and the political impasse of Stalinism raises more questions than answers. We find then that the problems of the new left, the inherited problems of the new left, go much deeper. Um, why does the 1930s communist left give up the goal of socialism? Why does it turn defeat into victory and tail after liberal Democrats? So, in the platypus reading group this is why we turn to the second international 
the high point of the Marxist revolutionary politics. This is why we are Platypus 1917, where the task of the inter international revolution fails and this defeat still plagues us today. In the United States, um, soft versions of Maoism emerged in the later 1960s as a kind of renewed internationalism. The Maoists retained the idea of the People's Front, of the Popular Front, borrowing as well what they understood as creative Maoist ideas. The Black Belt thesis figured for the new left as a kind of anti-imperialism, a colonial struggle at home. But these also inherited a hardened concept of the labor aristocracy as an irredeemable privileged caste, right? So like the trade unions. But it was no wonder, right? There's a kernel of truth since the unions had sold out the workers to the state, had facilitated the suspension of strikes for the war effort under the leadership of the Democratic Party. In addition, the new left adopted consciousness racing methods borrowed from the Chinese Maoists. It was through the women's movement where it imported the method of speaking bitterness, a form of consciousness raising that called for talking about personal trauma under oppressive forces as a way of understanding one's social condition. Um, I, I still have uh, at least about five to seven minutes uh, since we ran a bit late in the first part of the presentation. Um, so in addition to this popular front notion, what happened was that the feminist movement imported this raising of consciousness through speaking bitterness. And what this was, was an attempt to connect traumatic experiences under oppression to a sense of a kind of consciousness, sort of higher uh, racial, gendered, et cetera, consciousness. This was an imported technique from the Chinese Maoists who used this as part of their mobilization and political education in land reform campaigns by drawing on peasants' personal experience. The Maoists had attempted to force a political consciousness across the, across the peasants to gain their loyalty to the party. They pushed them to confess, confess their worst experiences in order to see the party as the tool to inflict retribution, to avenge themselves for the great injustices, right? But the left in the 1960s took this up without the mass party and today this has been even further internalized as a kind of self-castigating consciousness of the racist, sexist, bigot inside all of us. So one member was telling us recently that he had matched with a black girl on Tinder <laughs> and uh, before they could meet, she sent him um, a link to her PayPal account because she needed him to pay for reparations um, before they could go on their date. So that's that's one way, right? Like all white people must pay reparations somehow. So the problem persists today. And one of the ways in which uh, we can see how this problem persists is within the Democratic Socialist of America, which as Lori talked about, is a kind of uh, consolidation of the millennial left socialism, right? And um, recently, Adolf Fried, a prominent Marxist thinker and dissident voice within the new left, who Platypus reads a good deal, um, was recently canceled, or there was a call to cancel one of his events. Eventually, he himself pulled out as a result of the hula baloo on the basis that uh, he was a class reductionist, right? Because Reed doesn't believe that race is something to be celebrated, but something to be superseded. And the New York City DSD, SD, sorry, the New York City DSA steering committee um, decided to call for its cancellation uh, with the help of the Afro-Socialist Caucus, which is an independent body within DSA. The Afro-Socialist Caucus now claims to speak on behalf of all people of color within the organization. The caucus is an example exactly of the kind of liberal race relations framework that Reed himself has critiqued in the past as being part of this inheritance of the new left. And um, at the end of the day, one of the factions within DSA, uh, a, a Marxist faction called Class Unity, wrote in a statement, our failure to organize against the quote unquote liberals in the DSA has left us weak and incapable of defending basic principles of free speech, let alone Marxism. And this should give us some room for 
for Paul's because I think this is one of the problems that Platypus itself has experienced, which is that the liberal position, a sort of basic liberal understanding that civil society includes different discontents, different dissenting political voices, right, that are not necessarily an expression of cultural experience so much as of different opinions, has been shut down by the so-called liberals themselves. Um, quickly, I think that in conclusion, we have cancel culture as presenting a kind of flaring up of the racial management of neoliberalism at a moment of its disappearance. And uh, this is how the left lags behind the changes in capitalism. Capitalism itself is calling for a new management of social discontents. So we can see a split, for example, between union leaders who vote democratic, but the members of the trade unions who've now voted for Trump and will do so again. But they Did we just lose Pam? I think so. Pam, can you maybe rejoin? It's probably the her laptop battery died and she's probably screaming in her room right now. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a bit of the notes um, as, as she logs back in. Um, I, so, meaning, oof, yeah, so she was in the middle of that. Um, what I wanted to say, so it's to sort of draw back in, right, um, was this question of like now, 2020. Um, yeah, so we lost her. Um, so, kind of to repeat a little bit, since the 2020 election became important for the all sorts of anti Trumpists, the culture wars of the cultural turn of the new left and the culture wars of the 80s took, you know, sparked, flared up again quite intensely, uh, but took a new turn through these cancellations, deplatforming, and cancel culture, uh, which is a conservative response, a desperate response to the crisis of neoliberalism under Trump. When you, you know, what Pam and I really wanted to sort of point out was the cancel culture is a Democratic Party tactic use in the racial slash gendered democratic management of discontents with capitalism. So it is a real form of discontent, but it is not seen as a problem of capitalism, but a problem of individuals and their opinions or uh, behaviors, uh, sexual, racist, or uh, transphobic, or homophobic, and otherwise. So in the eve of 2020, of the 2020 election, right, we must ask, are the culture wars over? Have the Democrats won that war? Has the Democratic Party succeeded in usual, using cultural sensibilities, that is the castle culture, as a means to manage discontents with neoliberalism? I would say yes, the culture wars have, the, cult, the Democratic Party won, has won the culture wars, um, because they have become completely institutionalized into capitalism, um, not only into labor unions and HR departments and PR departments, um, it's into all sorts of civil society and uh, corporate culture. Uh, so yes, right, it's fully institutionalized uh, and it is the signal of a kind of victory for the Democrats. Now, will this win the Democrats the election? We only have to wait a few days to see, but that's a bit of our Pans and I sort of take of one, one of the, the factors that is at stake with this election, right, is the degree to which um, a Biden victory as Obama 2.0 or Hillary Clinton 2.0 will basically be the sort of final complete victory of this kind of neoliberal management of um, a discontent in capitalism, um, or um, right by defeating Trump, 
or we will get a few more, four more years of Trump. Pam, I was trying to conclude a little bit, uh, but maybe uh, you can also, uh, I, I brought in the 2020 election and whether or not Biden wins represents kind of like the final uh, flare up of and fully institutionalization of this kind of politics uh, or not. Mm. But yeah, sorry, I dropped off. Um, I think my battery, my battery died. I just, yeah, I wanted to just reiterate this point because I know it's a bit of um, a tricky point to make, but it's something that we say often in platypus. So I wanted to maybe just flesh it out that the left is lagging behind the kind of changes in capitalism that we might be witnessing in this moment of post neoliberalism, right? So the, the sort of oppositional politics of the new left have long now been institutionalized, have become part of the management of social discontents and this racialized or gendered democracy that has become the ideology of the Democratic Party is part of the management of social discontent, right? That the Democratic Party leads. And that's on its way out. That is why working class people, members of unions in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, voted the way that they did in 2016. So this kind of way of breaking up or understanding or describing the electorate um, is now falling apart. And like Lori pointed out that the Democrats didn't really learn their lesson, it seemed. In 2016, they doubled down on the, on the identitarian politics by presenting this Obama 2.0. And here we are in 2020, and the only thing that Biden has going for himself is that he was Obama's VP. And so somehow the party hasn't learned the lesson, but that's not to be expected. What, what is to be expected is that the left today, the Marxist left, the so-called self-understanding of a kind of socialist left, which doesn't exist, but nonetheless in name, would tail after the Democrats. Like that, that problem, that's our problem, that they're lagging behind the new opportunities that we may be experiencing in this change to a kind of post neoliberal moment. And that that potential is in those people that didn't vote for the Democratic Party, that may have voted for Obama, but that didn't vote for Hillary, and that will vote for Trump again in 2020. Yeah. That's that's it for the presentation. Yeah, I know we've talked for a while, so we should open it up. Okay, thank you both very much. Um, so this was a lot now. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would prioritize all questions uh, of understanding. Like if you haven't understand any of the concepts or refer references that uh, that were made, uh, please do that now. And then later on, maybe we can uh, do comments uh, and deeper discussion. So yeah, um, you can either post it in the chat or you, uh, I can unmute you. While we wait, Nils, uh, I was wondering if there was anything in the presentation that struck out to you that you found interesting or problematic or difficult to understand that we could use as a starting point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. one thing that, uh, can you maybe unmute yourself, unmute yourself so I don't have a Thank you. Uh, that that struck me was when you were talking about when you were, uh, were citing Daniel Kuhn Bendit uh, saying that uh, the left won uh, culturally and socially but not politically thank God I had to think about uh, like the problem of of the party or the problem of of authority and I had to think about uh, Lenin quoting Engels in State and Revolution saying that the revolution is the most authoritarian thing there is and how these two quotes kind of make up some make up the problem that we're talking about like how the new left had this problem of not being able to deal with the problem of the party or the problem of authority and hierarchy and uh, with that the problem of evolution yeah 
Yeah, meaning I brought it up when I was talking about the new SDS and some of the parallels, and, and definitely one of the first things on my list was sort of the anti-authoritarianism, right, of the new left, that the new SDS was reproducing, and certainly the, the Occupy movement took up in a new way, and certainly the DSA tried to address uh, different vague ways. Um, and, but that was like sort of combined with multiple things, right? Like anti-Stalinism, right? Like Stalinophobia. Um, and it was also combined with sort of like the flip side, like an anti-intellectualism uh, that came with, you know, like, you know, now is not the moment for thinking, now is the moment for action, and sort of this embrace of movementism, of activism that was fundamentally anti-authoritarian and anti-intellectual at the same time. I mean, this is something from the new left that we certainly inherited. Um, the Occupy movement in particular, I would say, was the strongest uh, millennial left example of this sort of anti-party, anti-position taking, anti-goals, uh, position taking that was really a rejection of kind of like the history of the left of the 20th century. Um, and certainly, yes, that the bigger problem that we have now is that, and the condition perhaps of why regression since the new left has been worse, worse, or at least definitely since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 89, but I would say definitely since the new left, is that right, there is no political party that can preserve the historical memory of those lessons, right? And what we have in Padabas is to basically be able to go to the first and second international and sort of learn uh, because of the political party discipline and the internal disputes that were taking place and the people that Luxembourg and Menden and Trotsky participated in, that we're able to sort of take certain lessons from history as a result of the taking very seriously the task of not only building a quote unquote vanguard party, but also building a vanguard party that is capable of leading sort of a revolution that takes over the state, right? And that's, and because of the legacy of Stalinism, meaning this is what we didn't really, really touch, but it was very much, and still is very much about part of, part of, part of this new left pedagogy, is that, you know, what we, live with as an example of the death of the left is the sort of yeah complete trauma over stalinism I'll just and put some maybe bones to it i mean I, I think that the so one of the ways in which platypus likes to think about like problems of the left is not to say like well these people just didn't get it or something like they were just like couldn't um, but like why confusion was motivated by a kind of problems that they've inherited. And so one of the ways in which the new left rejected uh, the Stalinist leadership in the party, um, why did they do that? I mean, I tried to present in my talk that one of the reasons is because it's through the communist party, it's through the Stalinists that labor is bound to the state, that it's through the popular front, through the leadership of the Communist Party, that the working class in America is disciplined to the state and through the state, that it's the suspension of strikes under the war effort that's led by the Democratic Party. And that's facilitated through the New Deal coalition, through the participation of socialists. And so the new left rejecting the leaders and propping up the kind of masses against the leaders, you could say is a kind of undigested way of critiquing this older generation that failed in their leadership of the working class movement, right? And so like in Platypus, we try to understand the kind of inherited problems of the left and their accumulated character in the present. So was the new left consciously rejected a previous model of left leadership in Occupy, it's completely unconscious. It becomes a matter of principle, right? Like why you shouldn't have goals, et cetera. As if it was desirable um, not to have like political ends. So they they turn a kind of defeat um, of previous generations into the victory of freeing themselves from goals. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so now we have a question from Lucas, which I will read out aloud. So the question is uh, to both speakers. You mentioned Adolf Reed Jr. and how the Black Caucus deplatformed him. But Adolf Reed himself was also campaigning for Sanders as candidate in the Democratic Party. Do you see welfare statism as something completely different to the culture wars or just as a different version of it? I think that this uh, nostalgia for the new New Deal, right, which we only touched on briefly, um, this idea that it's through uh, social welfare programs by um, getting the goods, right, by like putting labor as part of the putting labor on the seat of the table, um, like this kind of conception of what the socialist should be for. This is also something that Reed participates in. I don't think that this is a matter of culture wars, though. Um, and I should say that, like, you know, this this cancel stuff is is a tactic of a frustrated liberalism that goes now for many, many years. It's not a kind of rearticulation of the culture wars of the 1980s. Um, it's something quite different. And I mean, to the extent that uh, Reed and people in the DSA think that there ought to be a return to the 1930s, you know, they're, they're trying to, their conception of the Democratic Party is that you can work for meaningful reform within the Democratic Party. And this is really what's up for question. I mean, if we think of the high point of American communism as the 1930s and 1940s, then we'll quickly, we'll quickly find that this is the moment where the communists actually facilitated a kind of Bonapartist move where the where labor unions were subjected to the leadership of the Democratic Party. We still live in the shadow of that history. That's not a problem of the culture wars. That's a problem of Bonapartism and the failure of leadership among the socialists in the United States, but not only in the United States, right? It's a kind of problem inherited from the failures of the Second International, um, which, you know, I was trying to motivate that history that we do in Platypus. Like, why is it that we return to the text of Lenin, Trotsky, and Rosa Luxemburg? It's because the problems of the 60s are not only the problems of the 60s, and the inherited tasks of the 60s and the 30s are problems that arose much earlier that we're still sort of stuck in working through. Is that we are just doing it less consciously, um, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to, to um, uh, say real quick to the audience, if this was a lot and this was also like complex and provocative, so if you don't don't hesitate to ask a question if you don't if you don't know how to formulate it in English you can also do that in German that's no problem uh, but it would be really great if you have questions or comments or even uh, like uh, Widerspruch uh, to what was has been said mm, so then next I will uh, unmute Ephraim yeah you should be able to unmute yourself now. I, I think you have to click on the uh, like headphone symbol below the, the screens. Below the screens in the middle, kind of. <laughs> okay, now it works. Sorry, I have to like set up the whole thing. Um, I mean, in some ways, uh, thanks, Gloria, for having the presentation. Um, in some ways, my question follows on from Lucas's. Can you hear me clearly enough? It wasn't, but now it's okay. Okay. Um, from Lucas, which I guess is. You know, one of the major turns on the left has been this kind of neo-social democracy where the leading figures would reject cancel culture. Um, it's quite common to hear, um, you know, people from the Jacobin magazine milieu uh, criticizing cancel culture as being against the, what they consider to be their socialist politics. And you mentioned the example of Adolf Reed being, being like cancelled by the DSA. And obviously, straight away, Bascos and Barra had 
Adolf Reed on his podcast. Ephraim, you're coming in and out a lot, and we kind of can hear you, but it just the volume just goes up and down quite aggressively. So either it's your <laughs> I'm gonna go to conference. That one, that one. Is that better? Okay. Um, so a lot of these kind of neo-social democrats would also criticize council culture. And you know, as soon as Adolf Reed was cancelled, Bascar had him on the Jacobin podcast to be like, what the fuck, man? Um and so I guess Lucas was asking about, you know, how do you understand the relationship between those two things because one of the ways it would be understood by those kinds of people is as actually part of the kind of established progressive liberal attempt to uh, crush the neo-social democratic politics that they were advancing right so um you know, I mean, one of the main examples of cancel culture in recent years has been the cancelling of quote unquote anti Semites in the Labour Party. Right. Um, and so I wanted to ask about that kind of relationship. And just with that in mind, I just had read the editorial to the latest issue of Tribune magazine, which is kind of the British sister publication of Jacobin. And the editorial is about, the issue is called A Decade on the Left, and it's about the history of the millennial left. And so this kind of question really goes to Laurie's presentation of that history, which is that Ronan Burtonshaw, who writes the introduction, um, he basically says there was no left in the first decade of the 2000s. And then after 2008, um, this kind of left, which is serious about, quote, changing the system and not just reforming it, um, emerged. And that's what led to Podemos, Syriza, Corbyn and Sanders. Whereas in your narrative, Laurie, there's this kind of, it's actually the mid 2000s is the more kind of important moment. And then that's kind of lost after the election of Obama. So I wonder why you think that the narrative the left is telling is kind of the reverse of that, which is to begin things from really 2010. And yeah. Like anti austerity versus the anti war movement. Aha. Uh -huh. do, do you want to answer that part of the question? Well, right, because I was, I've forgotten that it was also coming from the British context. Um, well, certainly, a, yeah, meaning that sort of rejection, meaning it's the rejection of the anti imperialist left then, right? Like the rejection of the Cliffites, um, in a sense, the rejection of all that kind of activism and seeing it some kind of old fashioned uh, or, or something. I mean, all, the only thing I can point to is potentially that it has to do sort of like that's more like anti fa versus anti imp. Um, or that, right, that it's not until the state somewhat through anti-austerity measures, uh, the state becomes a sort of target again, um, a, in a different way, I suppose, like national policy of like, you know, where does the money go to? Uh, where does the money get cut off? Um, but I would like, in that case, like, you know, like this defense, the NHS stuff was there before 2010. Meaning it's 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 quite odd to me because from my perspective, with the exception of the Occupy bubble, really and and well, I guess there are two big exceptions. Black Lives Matter was actually sparked during Obama's presidency, and earlier Occupy was sparked during Obama's presidency. Uh, but for the most part, those eight years really of Obama felt quite like where the left was quite passive but um and inactive with with those two exceptions of occupy and blm if you count blm as, as a left um so yeah i find that quite odd but maybe that some way they can claim a new mantle of the rise of you know left unity in the uk as something new that gets rid of you know all the bad sectarians or something um i i wonder what you how what you made of that 
if any of that even makes sense. Yeah. So, I, I mean, yeah, I think it is about this idea that the left has overcome sectarianism um, and that the, 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 what the left shouldn't do now after the failure of Corbyn and Sanders is retreat to uh, small circles again, but somehow maintain this kind of um, wide reach for their ideas that they think they've had with socialism, um, what they call socialism. I think that does relate to the issue of like cancel culture because it's about whether they appeal to voters beyond the cultural concerns of a small milieu of, you know, um, essentially like upper middle class people. Um, and that's why, you know, to relate it to my first question, why I think they would position themselves against cancel culture. Um, and against okay. like politics in that way. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to reiterate here that the history that I laid out is that it's the Stalinists that opened the door, right, for the confusion of the new left by treating the role of socialists as defending labor interests to give the laborers a seat at the table of the Democratic Party. And that's the nostalgia that people like Reed and this kind of neo-social democratic types in the left have, right? So they're counterposing the emphasis on black interests, which seem to ignore class division for a kind of renewed representation of labor's interests at the seat of the democratic table. It's sort of, you know, two parts of the same coin, right? So because the idea is that we don't have this kind of movement for the abolition of class society, but that you need to get serious. And what getting serious is like having the Democrats take you seriously. So you're sort of constantly asking to be invited to the party, quite literally. Um, I don't know if that answers the issue of social democracy, but I think that that's, that's the conception. And what social democracy we mean now, it's this kind of 20th century, right, social democracy. Um, which is really a kind of inheritance of this kind of New Deal type politics. There was another question, I think, from the text box. Do we want to do that? You're muted, Niels. Yes, uh, I will read the next question by Antoine. Pam, you were mentioning the people that voted for Trump simply because they didn't want to vote for the Democratic Party and that these people would be potential voters for a more left position. Do you think that a new left or communist party would be able to get a majority? So what I said was that there are members of unions who voted for Trump because they felt like the imagination of the electorate that the Democrats had laid out no longer spoke to them. And what this potential is, is unclear, right? I wasn't saying that these people would necessarily vote for, there's no left. The left is dead. There's no left. So what it means though, to have this kind of potential social force that's not been already wedded to the political power of the Democratic Party should raise questions for anyone that's interested in a kind of socialist revolution in the United States. Um, but it's not as clear to me because we don't have a left, right, how that work would be done. But one of the things that would need to happen is to create a kind of independent consciousness of labor from the Democratic Party. So as opposed to making an argument that there is a neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party and potentially a more progressive wing of the Democratic Party that may speak to labor issues, right, which is the way in which is kind of neo-social Demo Democrats in America um, reconcile themselves to the Democrats. Um, it would be important to say that both parties, in fact, are parties of the capitalist class. And that in order to create the possibility even to have the social forces to create something like the Project for Socialism, which, by the way, is not just about building the party, right? Like, that's a misconception. It's not as if you'd, like, magically, like, build the party, right? Like, this kind of Lasallian conception and that, like, plugs in, 
Rather, you would have to actually build the social support, the self-conception by working people as constituted an, a class in and for themselves in a unified and revolutionary movement that then can have the clarity of vision to, to demand that a party represent what they stand for, right? So it's not a question of plugging in a party, of building the tiny party or something. That's what the sectarians have been doing now for decades and the shit hasn't worked. Maybe just something uh, short uh, following that. Uh, I think this that touches what you also said in the presentation, like the who whom question, like is the left thinks that they are using the Democratic Party, but actually the Democratic Party is using the left. And uh, that this, I think this is something very important to this aspect yeah. of like an independent organization of the working class, which has been abandoned. Yeah, I think that it's like Lori's point about 2016, right? Like what happened in 2016? Okay, there were all these aspirations by the millennial left that they could use the party to prop up their candidate. And to some degree, that did happen. You had this massive support for Bernie Sanders, not only in the United States, but around the world. But what happened to that support after the party sank the candidate, right? Because it's like no secret now after WikiLeaks and all this. I mean, it's no secret that the Democratic Party systematically sunk Bernie Sanders, okay? Because they're not just like an everybody come big tent organization, but they're a disciplined political and ideological party. Um, the lesson should have been like, this is not our party. Instead, what happens is that people, including Sanders, rallied, right, behind Clinton as a candidate, and therefore brought a new generation, new life, like into the Democratic Party, basically reconciled the enemy, the class enemy, if you will, like in the terms, you know, like sort of older terms, the class enemy, the leadership of the class enemy, to this new kind of inchoate aspirational energy of people that maybe wanted something more than was being served by the status quo. So it turned these oppositional politics in record time into the new status quo of the Democratic Party with the help of the Democratic Socialists, who somehow in 2020 still believe that the Democratic Party is a fight between some kind of new labor, social democratic forces, progressive forces, and the so-called neoliberal wing of the party. I mean, I feel like the trajectory of AOC is us, like someone who was claim to be in the DSA Queens chapter or whatever, right? AOC, um, even though I don't follow her that much, right? She's become very much, besides like supporting Cuomo, supporting like several like establishment, you know, establishment Democrats, um, certainly participated in um, aspects and, and claims, right? Because as a Latina woman has definitely like picked up like has played a role in continuing sort of this, uh, this, this sort of victory of a Latino woman from a working class like neighborhood in Queens um, idea as sort of part of the rebranding of the Democratic Party, right? The DSA allowed the rebranding of the Democratic Party. And secondly, I feel like I want to contest a little bit this idea that the neo-social Democrats are against cancel culture. I mean, like they're just incoherent on this front. Like, look what happened to Reed. Like, so what the DSA did, in effect, was like, you know, instead of like pushing for like cancel culture stuff, making these caucuses, which come, you know, the Black Caucus, whatever separate caucus, uh, which come through like the deep history of the left of like I didn't tell you, I mean, there used to be a Jewish fund in the Russian Social Democratic Party in the Polish Social Democratic Party. There's a history there. But because there was supposed to different interests that needed to be accounted for. Um, uh, but um, look, I, the point is that the DSA opens the door. So when when the Afro Socialist Caucus canceled Reed or called for his cancellation, right? Which we should be clear, like Reed himself ended up pulling out of the event as a result of this, right? They didn't actually cancel him. They were just like calling for his cancel. They accused him of being a class reductionist. And then Reed went on the Jacobin podcast and say, they're the race reductionists. So like, 
So, so what's going on here? Like, what's the vision of society that's competing up against one another within the DSA? Like the reason why this liberal conception of society and where different interests get a seat at the table is being rehashed through the DSA is because they've never moved on from the problems of the 1930s. Their nostalgia for the New Deal shows us that their conception of society as the multiple interests coming together to negotiate who gets what, that's what they consider socialism. Socialism gets the goods. And the goods are the goods that are being doled out through the state, right? So their highest aspirations is that the socialists can lead welfare reforms, can return to a kind of FDR moment where communists get a seat at the table. That's why they open the door. This conception of society opens the door to then saying, well, listen, like we represent the black interests and you're leaving us out of the party. So you're representing labor, we're representing blacks, they're representing trans people, they're representing women, and you're class reductionist because you're only speaking from the perspective of class interests. But the whole point about the working class for Marx, the proletariat, was not that they represented the interests, right? The issue of the for itself, the in itself and the for itself, the kind of historical consciousness of the potential for the historical epochal change of capitalism was not that workers were somehow revolutionary because of their interests. This is why Mike McNair critiques this ideology that happens in the popular front as an expression of trade union consciousness, right? The idea that what the socialists are there to do is just express the narrow material interests of the working class. Whereas in fact, what it's trying to do, what the socialists ought to be trying to do is clarify the historical task of socialism of the end goal of the classless society beyond the nation state. And that's what the DSA doesn't understand because it has this nostalgia for the 1930s as the high point of socialism. When again, the labor leaders reconciled labor with the leadership of the Democratic Party to go to war, world war. Okay, I will read out the next question by Efrain. Um, uh, why does this racketeering necessarily split into race versus class and not settle for class-based labor racketeering, including blacks on that basis? Just for everyone who doesn't know, rackets are interest groups or like it's kind of lobbyism. Mm -hmm. I, I think I understand Efrain's question. Um, I think it's a holdover, right, of the kind of ideological leadership of the Democratic Party. Of, of of how it has been able to win elections, meaning like the rackets of identitarian sort of a breakup of the electorate, um, uh, I, you know, has been able has been able to help them win elections. And I, I was trying to give like a deep history of this. I said something like the Democratic Party ends up being the the ones who lead politically in integrating the the working class in the United States, right? Like through the civil rights movement. Um, and so there's, there's the fact that it has worked, right? And there's the question of whether or not it may stop working, whether or not it already has stopped working, um, you know? And maybe it is the case that, you know, when Donald Trump said in 2016, um, I think it was 2016 or 2017 that, Uh, the Republicans are now, again, the party of labor, right? Like that you could see a transformation of the electorate in this way, as people conceive in themselves then of like the new labor rackets. That's completely possible. And that doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, that it will be a turn to the left, right? Like it's the labor rackets to begin with in the 1930s that led us to this problem of wedding the in independent uh, organizations of labor to the state. Right. So the like a turn from race rackets or gender rackets to the labor rackets is not necessarily a turn to the left. Um, that would be a misconception. But I feel like it also like I think you're right, Pam, but thinking out loud here, um, I feel like the notion of class, similar to something that you said would actually be divisive within the interests of capital, right? Whereas it might actually 
um, it show that the Democratic Party doesn't, you know, it's not in the interest, working in the interest of like working class politics. It actually, its history under neoliberalism has shown the complete liquidation and push to liquidate of labor unions as much as possible, the radicalization of labor unions as much as possible. Um, the Democrats, and definitely under the Clintons and Obama, were probably more important in sort of the dismantling of the American welfare state uh, than Reagan was, in the same way that the new labor under Blair was more important in the giving the final blow to a labor in the UK than Thatcher was. Uh, you know, they finished the job and um, in, in both parties with sort of that, that moment of the 90s with the new labor and, and the Clintons. So I feel like it's just, it, it actually, the question sort of just raises the degree to which the Democratic Party really is the vanguard of neoliberalism or the Labor Party was really the vanguard of neoliberalism, whereas it is assumed that it was Reagan and Thatcher. And the question of class would somehow reveal that because they they have, you know, staked their claims and gotten their voter bases on the car on the grounds of these sort of identitarian issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the question was why does it necessarily split into race versus class and whether or not it could there could be a kind of return of a sort of I would say not maybe class but labor based kind of racketeering. Um, and I think you already see the attempts to do that by the Republican Party, right? And their appeals to labor on the basis of trade deals um, under the Trump administration has been one attempt to kind of recapture um, this imagination of the electorate. And you know, and it's it's interesting because in the last debate, in the last in the last debate between Biden and Trump, um, you know, at the end of it. They asked him, how would you, Mr. President, Vice President, um, reunite the nation? Like we we live in a divided, divided nation. And how would you reunite the nation? And Donald Trump said the most sensible thing, I think, out of the two, which is that, you know, I would create uh, economic success and success brings people together. Rising wages brings people together. Um, and that's true. That's true. And I think that that now that narrative of success in the American economy somehow today appeals a lot more to people because in part because of the failures of the Democratic Party establishment under Obama to work through the 2007 2008 crisis. Right. It appeals a lot more to people than the divided rackets of racial gender democracy where people are fighting for the last piece of the pie. Um, and so I guess we have to think about how this conversation shifts. I agree with what you said, Laurie. I think, again, though, to just pose it in terms of the neo-social Democrats, like a turn to labor racketeering, right, and kind of the labor rackets is not necessarily uh, uh, an opportunity on the face of it for socialism. Um, you know, it's, we'll see. And certainly, like, the problem with intersectionality that it does treat class as some sort of identity um that that in itself seems to be strange to me right that the, the the class question then gets like lumped into sort of race and gender and sexuality or whatever whereas really is entirely different question but we do you know under sort of like adorno and horkheimer and you know, we do live in the world where like class, like conflict, class distinction, the class struggle has been liquidated, but through the right, right? Through uh, the, the the defeats of the left. And so we kind of live in a, a classless society, but one that is extremely authoritarian still um, and cannot really, yes, uh, push on the, the, on the ground to somehow overcoming class. Uh, conflict. I think there is a request here for kind of simplified versions of these complex topics, um, given that uh, we have like native German speakers. Um, we apologize for that. I think that it's difficult sometimes to present some of these things in a simplified way, but I hope that at least one of the things that Lori and I have laid out is this kind of 
troubles that the millennial left has inherited, right? So like that that was really like our point of the the presentation is that we as two millennials, like older millennials in Platypus, recognize that in the present, the left doesn't really have the tools to make sense of all of the obstacles that it faces. And so we tried to reach into the deep history of the left to show you that some of these problems are things that we've inherited without understanding the right questions to ask and that platypus is trying to formulate the right questions to try to understand how the present presents us with obstacles that we may be able to address politically in the future. So if you're going to get one thing from this presentation, if not all of the details, that framework, I think, is what we're bringing um, today. Yes, I would also like to add up on that, that um, it's it, these are very complex topics and Platypus is invited to like go deeper into them and we provide the necessary framework to to uh, to allow you to to get like moments of teaching and I think it's good to be blown away in the beginning by something complex and then being like eager to learn so when you have any question about what has been said please feel free to to ask the question even if you think it's a stupid question or uh, whatever you can just uh, like don't hesitate and we know it's uh, we, it's difficult that we invited English speakers but thought that uh, we can all draw from the experience that Laurie and Pam have. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, first point is that Platypus has one rule about questions is that there's no such thing as stupid questions. And in our experience, it's in fact the simplest or quote unquote potentially more stupid questions that pretty much 100% of the time are the most important ones. And like formulating questions is kind of what we want to provoke, right? Like what 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 looking at the history of the left, like what Potipus has done uh, during the last 14 years is to sort of look at the history of the left uh, and, and look at the history of Marxism in order to be able to formulate some of these questions. Um, and it's kind of very important and uh, to sort of see that um, aspect of Platypus. Yeah, and also uh, Lucas just mentioned that there will, will be a coffee break, coffee pause event on Friday where we just meet like very loosely and you can model circle and uh, you can ask any question that you have or yeah. also in German then. <laughs> Again, sort of, there's no such thing as a, a stupid or simple question. Um, I really want to know if people have disagreements. I mean, like, there's, you know, like, we've we've really laid out, you know, a, a, a sort of polemic in, in some respects um, about how to understand the stuff. I don't know if, um, if the audience has, like, critiques, um, which would be good for us to engage uh, different ways of understanding some of the problems. Um, maybe your own experiences with uh, cancel culture, neo-social democracy, et cetera, that you found compelling. Ephraim asks, so will cancel culture disappear or is it the new normal? I don't know. You know, I'm kind of divided about this. In 2016, um, it felt like, uh, you know, Lori raised this in her presentation that we were like, okay, maybe this is a moment of opportunity where like clearly the strategy of doubling down on identity politics didn't work for the election. So people will like get the message, right? And try to think of new ways of thinking about the problems in society and how to overcome them. And no, it's been like a redoubling down. And so I, I, in a kind of maybe hopeful way, characterize cancel culture as flaring up at a moment where maybe the way that it speaks to the social discontents can no longer really adequately represent them. Um, and so that it's a kind of passing image. Um, but that's a very hopeful reading. You know, I feel like there's, there, there is a way that it ha has become institutionalized. Um, but we, we still have to remember that it's become institutionalized in like a very key but small percentage of the population, like mainly kind of middle class urban elites. 
universities, museums, and this part. So what may happen is there's a kind of doubling down one part of the population, but a kind of, because of the doubling down, a kind of like increasing uh, rejection that starts to speak up in other parts of, of the population. And that may cause a kind of conflict between the two, which would be more interesting than just like, you know, like accepting this, this narrative as the new, like liberal, liberal norm, you know, um, you know, like one, one thing that one of our members pointed out is that, uh, in America, the, um, American civil, uh, uh, liberties union, the ACLU, um, who, you know, has for a very long time defended the free speech of, of all like positions, right? Free speech from, from the left, from minority positions on the right, like the KKK, like neo-Nazis, et cetera, their right to protest in the streets, they've defended them, is now um, under attack by the left, by the so-called liberal left um, for defending the right-wingers right to free speech. And I, I heard the former head of the ACLU speak on why they have this position. And he just laid out a very straightforward liberal argument, which was that, well, we defend the First Amendment because as soon as you attack the First Amendment, you know, the first people to be targeted after those attacks are, are going to be minority positions on the left. Um, and that's why we defend the First Amendment. And he was just a basic, you know, liberal. And, and that position is now kind of being eclipsed, um, which would endanger any kind of possibility for leftists, socialists especially, to speak. Um, and so the fact that that doesn't dawn on people, right? Like what will need to happen in order for people to recognize that, um, that civil society is something worth preserving and that the racket competition of like racial clans or something doesn't really help us in trying to organize for socialism. Who knows? I am more also um, of two minds. I know, and I know Ephraim knows this, that Chris would say that council culture is done. The culture wars are done because they become institutionalized and so they're done. I'm a little um, unsure even if Biden wins uh, because there is an element of like of looking into the council culture that it is coming like you don't get some people don't get canceled unless someone wants their job or their position, right? I feel like it will sort of it's highly speculative, but I feel like it relates to like economic recovery and uh, lowering unemployment uh, for people to be able to not need cancel culture so much. Um, and whether or not Trump can you know produce that, I don't know. Whether Biden can produce that, very unlikely. But you never know. And I think that it will kind of be dependent on how fast, if we believe Trump leading the post, like, you know, how how there might be a new route in post neoliberalism, even if it's more conservative and perhaps more scary or worse than what we have now in post neoliberalism. Um, it will probably be the, the, the continued presence and need for stuff happening with council culture, I think will depend on, yeah, the availability of jobs and like proper quality of life produced by jobs and capitalism. Okay, so Stefan is asking how these phenomena play out in Germany. So uh, maybe something uh, on Germany. From what we can tell, this phenomenon has been delayed in certain respects, right? If we talk about the broader cultural return, it definitely seemed from a panel recently, the German chapter that I heard of, right? Like woke culture and this kind of mentality has definitely penetrated uh, and right. So, and this has boiled down to, right? What Pam was talking about, decolonize your mind, decolonize your space and like, you know, sh shut up and let the black woman speak um, uh, has definitely uh, penetrated Germany. Um, and it might be, somewhat different but it seems to be here even if it's slightly lagging behind but the character very sort of shocking character of that german panel the leipzig panel um was that basically right like what was it capitalism is is, is so the is, formulation was that um 
Marxism and capitalism are themselves categories that have been inherited from a kind of imperialist, colonialist, racist conception. And that we need to return to some kind of, I don't know, was it like black spirituality or some sort of pre-modern conception of the community that doesn't deploy these categories, you know? I got it. Why capitalism, talking about capitalism, talking about uh, history is white supremacist. That was the line from that panel. Everything is white supremacy. Everything yeah. is like, what, everything that doesn't advance, like this minorities, racketeers, positions, um, I will be white supremacy. I mean, you know, it's funny because of course, like, uh, like in America, when, when you say, well, isn't this essentialist, you know, like, uh, this kind of standpoint of authenticity of experience is essentialist and you kind of have to break it down in German. You can be like, don't you remember Heidegger? Like you can just sort of say like, you know, this idea that the only form in which you can speak about politics is through cultural authenticity, right? Like that needs to be defeated. Right. Like I, I feel like the historical amnesia in Germany, right. It's, it's quite like dense, um because there's there's such a there's an impact on the narrative of the left that has been inherited from this kind of heideggerian notions of essentialism and somehow to hear it on the panel in leipzig uh which was on anti-racism that we did uh was a really was kind of dumbfounding and um, that people could just sort of repeat these things but yeah it's essentialism i mean and it's essentialism sort of across the board But Lori, wasn't you, weren't you like, I forget now, like the Humboldt Forum and all the stuff that's going on in Berlin, like all these like arguments in the art world about like the return of like the colonial objects, like isn't that stuff happening in like mainstream, like cultural conversations in Germany? Yeah, but in proper, like, um, I guess German fashion is being sort of uh, neutralized by sort of I think that the, the Prussian Foundation, uh, in particular, the director of that foundation, has been quite ready for for sort of this, you know, post-colonial um, ideology um, that they've played themselves a role in sort of trying to return and reframe the conversation. For example, museums invite Syrians and people from the particular regions of the Middle East to give the tours, free tours, um, to uh, people to talk about these historical artworks or something, uh, right? That's like the remedial thing, like we'll give a voice to the Syrians so you can go see the beautiful gates of whatever they called it at the um, Parthenon, not the Parthenon, yeah, the, um, Pergamon. Um, and yeah, so it is, it's, 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 I feel like it's, sort of like such a sensitive subject that it's tried to sort of keep our head of the curve and trying to neutralize those kinds of tensions. Um, but the IFD definitely, or the sort of all the tales around the IFD definitely included and I think sparked a strengthening of like things on the grounds of identity. There was a huge march, wasn't like Dorna who was sort of talking about, wasn't the giant like, anti-racism march where like everybody on the broad spectrum of left to right was sort of present um, on this sort of vague grounds of like anti-racism. Okay, just really quick. Um, I think uh, after these questions, maybe we can wrap this up because uh, like the official time is over and um, maybe some other people want to test the audio before they do the event. So I will post a uh, Zoom link. So if anyone wants to like keep on discussing, we just can discuss there. So this room will be free for the other events taking place. Thank you everyone for uh, participating and thank you, Laurie and Pam, for the great uh, input and the good discussion. Bye and thank you so much, Niels. And yeah, we can take the questions there, but I think we should maybe leave the room.
دادند Hi. Right. 